death docks into epicardial cells set on the edge of the heart and those epicardial cells with this signal know to march into the myocardium. So there they are marching in. <laughs> now the next thing they do, obviously now we're in a macroscopic picture, is a very important, absolutely fundamental part of, of making new muscle, which is to vascularize it. So with the new veins in there, the fish ends up with a brand new heart with new muscle, and not only new muscle, but all of the appropriate coronary vasculature to innervate it. And the fish can actually survive and swim away. So we can't do that. But boy, boy, would we like to be able to do that. I mean, I don't want my heart cut up, but if it ever happened, I'd like to be able to swim away like that. Now, what's the difference between fish and mammals, really, then? Well, let's just look at it from a very simplistic point of view. Hearts can regenerate with tissue replacement in a fish. Several different layers of cells seem to be involved. There seem to be stem cells within the myocardium, and then this magical layer that is the origin of the coronary vasculature in development for the heart seems to recapitulate that same program and become, again, capable of making new blood vessels. In the human, heart failure is caused by tissue loss and no replacement. So what are the possible ways that we could address this problem? Well, we could study the fish, and that's exactly what people are doing. What makes it so possible for a fish to be able to do this? But we can't wait as human beings to understand exactly what's happening in the fish. We'd like to be able to start treating the patients who are in the clinics right now. Can we replace heart cells to treat the disease? Well, this idea actually has its origins in some very intriguing observations early on in heart transplant medical practice. So in a transplant, a truly failed heart that can no longer work is removed and a healthy heart from a donor is put in its place. And you literally sew the veins and the, and the arteries onto the new heart and the new heart can function more or less as the old heart did. This is a very complex procedure. It's very expensive. And it, the problem is there aren't that many hearts floating around to use for the many, many people who need them. Nevertheless, the fact is that when you put a heart into a foreign host, you can ask interesting questions about that heart. Does that heart get any cells from the host? Does it incorporate cells from its host? Now, if, in fact, the heart that was put into a patient comes from a female into a male patient. The male patient in each one of his cells has a Y chromosome that the whole heart that was transplanted does not. So scientists have probes that we can use to show whether a cell has a Y chromosome or not. And so we can actually then go into autopsy situations after the patient has eventually died and look at that transplanted heart that often was living in that patient, that female's heart was living in that male patient could be for decades, and look to see whether there were any male cells that ended up in the female heart. And miraculously, there are quite a few. So this means that a normal functioning heart can actually pick up cells from its environment. So if that's the case, how is it doing it? Is it picking it up from neighboring vas vessels? Or is it picking it up from the bone marrow? Because of course, the bone marrow is full of male cells, and the blood's going through the female heart every day. We just don't know the answer to that, but it suggests that the heart is capable of picking up cells that are circulating. So with that encouraging piece of rather arcane information in hand, scientists have begun to think about how to take stem cells from a patient, namely bone marrow stem cells, from a patient that's healthy in their bone marrow but has a horrendously failed heart, and see if they can actually help the patient that way. Now remember that these progenitor cells have to do two things that I showed you the zebrafish does effortlessly. Number one, they have to make new muscle cells. And number two, they have to be able to put blood vessels through that muscle to give it the appropriate oxygen. So I'm going to tell you a little bit now about where we stand with these sorts of trials, because they're ongoing for patients that have had acute myocardial infarction. And these are uh, trials that are based entirely on bone marrow stem cells from the patient themselves going into themselves. So these are what we call autologous transplants. And uh, these can be uh, extracted from the patient's bone marrow and 
cultured, purified, depending on the protocol. Some of the trials have used certain subsets of bone marrow cells called endothelial progenitor cells, or EPCs. Others have reasoned that muscle cells might be possibly useful, even though they're not heart, they contract, maybe they would work as well. And these cells are then introduced in various ways into the heart of the patient. Now, in the case of the left-hand protocol, there is an infusion balloon that runs through the aorta down into the patient's heart and delivers the cells that way. So catheterization of the circulation in human patients is something that is very, very well understood and is quite uh, routine. Alternatively, you can use needle injection with a catheter and a flexible needle so that you can actually put the cells into the myocardial wall, or you can just open up the patient's chest and jam the cells in, Pulp Fiction style. Now, <laughs> I'm going to tell you about one very recent trial that was just published about a month and a half ago in which that first method was used, intracoronary infusion. In this case, the patient was uh, acute myocardial infarction patient, heart attack recent patient, comes into the clinic and is chosen to go either into a placebo group or into the group that's going to get the cells. So what this means, and it's, it, these, these are very complicated trials to set up because you also have to blind all the people who are doing the trial to whether the patient is getting cells or just serum, just you know saline. Because you might be able to pick up all sorts of effects based on perception. And so you want to get rid of all of that. So these are now trials that are called double-blinded placebo-controlled trials. These trials mean that many patients come in. Some of them are secretly in a, in a placebo group. Some of them are secretly in the group that's going to get the cells. They're all treated as any patient should be treated for myocardial infarction, but there's just this added extra treatment. And then the question is, what happens? Now, this was a trial, a very large trial, and many patients were enrolled, and the results just came out. And the answer is encouraging on one level, but a little bit disappointing on another. As you see from the numbers here, patients that received the bone marrow got a 5.5% increase in their function as measured by ejection fraction, which is the amount of blood that is ejected out of your heart. So the better the ejection fraction, the stronger your heart is. Now, of course, some people rec recover spontaneously from heart attacks. And you can see that by the number of the placebo, which is 3%. So a 3% increase in the capacity for the heart to do better was what you would get anyway. Now, this is not going to cure anybody in the long haul. And so clearly, although it's a proof of principle that there is some effect, beneficial effect, we are far from the optimal protocol. Clearly, we have a lot of work to do. So what are the other ways in which we can address this? Maybe we can stimulate the heart itself to make new cells. And if that's the case, maybe that would help us to address the issue. So in our lab, we've tried a technique in mouse to see if that would work. And you're familiar with this story because of the IGF-1 growth factor treatment I told you about yesterday for muscular dystrophy. In this case, we tried the same trick, except we addressed the question of heart regeneration. To do this, we made a mouse that overexpressed this transgenic IGF-1 in the heart. And we did so by injecting a cardiac transgene into the heart of a mouse. And then we followed that mouse as the progeny developed that had the gene expressing this growth factor within the heart and looked to see whether we had any effect at all on the heart or whether these animals developed abnormally because we're putting a lot more of this growth factor into these mice and they have this growth factor from conception onwards. And miraculously, we found that the animals regulated very well. They saw the growth factor. They didn't seem to mind the growth factor. The only thing that we did see is that if you look at these pictures of mouse hearts as they get older, at two months of age, the mice had slightly larger hearts if they had IGF-1. But it was just a precocious growth to an adult stage because we found larger cells, which in this case was what we expected, but those cells never did anything other than get to the size they normally would be in a six-month-old mouse, and then the mouse seemed totally normal. So on one hand, we were very happy, and on the other hand, we wondered if we had just wasted our time. So we decided 